Good morning, and welcome to Living Your Best Exile 3.0. Today's uh, time is brought to you by Coffee Time with Chris. Grab a good cup of coffee. Go ahead, pause me. Grab a good cup of coffee. And then we're going to dive into it. So today, we're talking about a deep theological idea called justification. Because justification is our kind of first point of moving out of exile, right? Because exile has been going on long before coronavirus, right? Exile uh, is kind of part of the DNA of the Christian message, right? We were made for Eden, for perfect relationship with God, with one another, and somehow we got Evans. That's an exile. That's not God's best God wants us home. He wants to draw us back home. And the beginning of that journey is justification. Have you ever had a conversation with someone and they told you, you know, when I, when I was 13, I was at a youth camp and somebody preached the gospel and I was saved. You ever heard that? They talk about salvation. They got saved as if it was just kind of a moment. It happened in a moment. What they really mean is they were justified. They had justification. And justification is part of salvation, but it's, it's half of salvation. It's not the whole thing. Uh, so they're not necessarily wrong. They're just not very theologically nuanced. So with that in mind, I want us to look at uh, justification in a deeper light. And to do that, we're going to start in Exodus chapter 11. Exodus chapter 11, pick it up in verse 4. So Moses said, This is what the Lord says. About midnight I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the female slave who is at the hand mill. And the firstborn of all the cattle as well. They, there will be a loud wailing throughout Egypt. Worse than there has ever been or ever will be again. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark at a person or animal. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these officials of yours will come bowing down before me and saying, Go, you and all your people who follow you. After that, I will leave. Then Moses, hot with anger, left Pharaoh. So this is the final plague. God has brought plagues of frogs, gnats, flies, all this stuff. But now it's the final plague. And it's the plague against the firstborn. God is going to kill the firstborn son of Pharaoh, firstborn son of the female slave. Uh, in chapter 12, we find out he kills the firstborn son of the prisoners of Egypt and, of course, the firstborn of the livestock. Now, you may be thinking, Chris, this sounds a bit harsh. Why would God do that? Well, part of it is context, right? Eighty years before this, Pharaoh <clears throat> had called for all the firstborn, it's actually not all the firstborn, just all the male children of the Israelites who were two years old and younger to be killed. All the two-year-old boys and younger to be killed. So God is avenging the Israelites against the Egyptians, Right? They had drawn first blood, and God is making that right in some level. But I hear your question. You go, well, Chris, I kind of get that, but why again the, the firstborn of the slave? Why the firstborn of the prisoner? God's actually showing us something really deep, deep theologically here. By nature, or by definition, a slave is someone who does the will of a master, whether they want to or not. By definition, a prisoner is one who is held under the control of another, whether they want to be or not. When Adam and Eve sinned, uh, they became slaves to selfishness and self-centeredness. Um, that's the way of Satan, right? We became slaves to the way of Satan. Um, the way of Satan is to put yourself above God to want to serve yourself rather than God, to believe that you can find satisfaction for your soul without God. 
So in this story, Pharaoh represents the devil. God is revealing that those who are slaves and prisoners to Pharaoh, watch this. God is revealing that those who are slaves and prisoners to Pharaoh will fall under the same judgment as Pharaoh. That's really important. Because those who are enslaved and imprisoned to the devil, who live under his way of selfishness, self-centeredness, rebellion against God, they're going to fall under the same judgment as the devil because they're living out the way of the devil. They're living out the will of the devil. So perhaps you may be saying, Chris, that sounds a little strong. I don't know how to process that. That sounds a bit harsh. But the gospel invites us to realize that our reality is more dire than we naturally think. It's life is, uh, there's more going on behind the scenes than we actually realize. Now at this point you may be asking a very obvious question. You're saying, Chris, but what about the Israelites? They were enslaved to the Egyptians. They were slaves to Pharaoh. Why aren't they being judged by God too? That's a brilliant question. It's a brilliant question. For hundreds of years, they've been slaves to Pharaoh. They may have <clears throat> made false idols. Maybe they had built temples to false Egyptian gods. Why would God let them off? It's a great question. And to really answer that question, let's skip ahead to chapter 12. We'll look at verse 7. It says, uh, and before the kind of the backstory on this verse, is God had told them that the Israelites to take a spotless lamb or a spotless goat and take it into the house and then sacrifice it. And then he says this, then take some of the blood of the lamb or goat and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frame of the houses where they are to eat the lambs. And then skip on down to verse 12. On the same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. Then he says this, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Notice the Israelites are protected from God's judgment because of the blood of the spotless lamb over the door. This is important. It's not about how good the Israelites are. It's not that they're not slaves because they are. It's about the blood over the door. When the angel sees the blood, he passes over the Israelites. And this, my friends, is justification. Justification is about being pardoned by God for our sins. Let's talk about pardon. Pardoning is an act of forgiveness of sin. Okay? So think about it for a minute. Pardoning means that the offended party absorbs the cost. For example, you invite me over to your house. We have dinner, and I'm kind of uh, moving around your house. I've been known to be a bull in a china shop, and uh, I knock over a really nice lamp and break it. And then you say, Chris, I'll handle it. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to fix it. I'll, I'll buy a new lamp. Now, here's what I need you to understand. Forgiveness is not cheap. It's not free. It comes at a cost. But you forgiving me means that that cost doesn't come to me. It's you. You pay the cost for me. So justification isn't God looking at us going, it's all good, man, don't worry about it. Sin is a big deal. Like God is forgiving our sin at the cost of his own life. Justification doesn't mean you are suddenly not guilty. It means Jesus has taken the penalty of your guilt upon himself. So notice, God passing over the Israelites is not about them not being guilty. It's also not about God being blind. God's not like, oh, those are perfect people in, in the house down there. Let's not mess with them. No, it's about God seeing the blood of the Lamb covering them. God is passing over Israel not because they are better than the Egyptians. He's passing over them because of the blood over their doors. 
Now, why is that important? It's important because it goes against basically how other religions work. How other religions tend to work is you do a bunch of good things, and if you do a bunch of good things, you kind of justify yourself before that God, and then when you die, you receive paradise or nirvana or some kind of the reward of that God. But that's not how the Jewish Passover worked, right? God wasn't giving the Israelites what they deserved. He was looking at the blood of the Lamb and then passing over them, giving so that the judgment that he only wanted to bring on Pharaoh didn't fall on them too. So, uh, that is why it's important that we recognize justification because oftentimes people still think from another religious point of view. Think about it like this. You're talking to someone and they said, or you ask them, you know, if, if you were to die, would, would you go to heaven? Do you believe that? A lot of times people will tell you, yeah, I'd probably go to heaven. I'm basically a good person. Do you hear it? It's that idea that because I basically do good things, I will justify myself before God. That's not the gospel. The gospel doesn't say you're basically a good person. Matter of fact, the gospel says you're basically sinful and you're basically selfish and you're basically broken. And if you are honest at all, you probably go, yep, yeah, that's me. But the gospel says you're forgiven not because of your goodness or my goodness, but because of Jesus' goodness and death in our place. Therefore, the gospel says that God loves us while we were still sinners right? God hates sin, but he actually loves sinners, and he longs to forgive us if we will receive Jesus and his salvation. So, if justification is about the work of God on our behalf, not about our work, what is our role in justification? What part do we have to play in this? That's a great question. Romans 4, 5 says, However, the one who does not work but trust God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited to them as righteousness. Our part is to put our faith in Jesus and in his death in our place and in his resurrection in our place. We are justified by putting our faith in Jesus. And this is how, as Christians, we put the blood of the Lamb, right? Jesus is the ultimate Lamb. He's the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. So when we put our faith in Him as Lord and in His death and resurrection on our behalf in the cross, that is essentially putting the blood of Jesus over the doorpost of our hearts, right? Now you may be asking a good question. You may be saying, but Chris, if I'm basically broken, if I'm basically a prisoner to selfishness and self-centeredness, why would I ever give my life to Jesus? Why would I ever surrender my life to Jesus? Why, if I'm, if I'm uh, by fallen nature naturally not going to believe in the salvation of God, why would I ever put my faith in Jesus? That's a good question. And the answer is grace. Provenient grace is God empowering me to say yes to him. God empowering me to believe in his salvation. So let me give you an example of what that looks like. I grew up in church. went to church all the time. I heard about Jesus all the time. heard about the cross all the time. But when I was seven, God began to stir in my heart. And I remember I was talking to my mother in the kitchen, I was asking her a million questions about Jesus. A million questions. God's grace was stirring my heart to believe in Jesus and to put my faith in Jesus as the ultimate lamb, the ultimate sacrifice on my behalf. My mother astutely recognized that the grace of God was working in my heart. And so she said, Chris, do you want to surrender your life to Jesus? Do you want to give him your heart? And I said, yes, ma'am, absolutely. And we prayed. I repented of my sin. And I, I, I declared my faith that Jesus is Lord and that he died in my place and that he rose in my place. And God justified me in that moment. 
I received justification in that moment, not because of my goodness, but because of his. And that's where this story ends. Uh, in verse 23 of chapter 12, it says, When the Lord goes throughout the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood uh, on the tops of the door frames and will pass over the doorway, and he will not permit the destroyer to enter the house and strike you down. And then verse 29, At midnight the Lord struck down all the firstborn of the in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of prisoner who is in the dungeon to the firstborn of the livestock. Brothers and sisters, I want to finish with this idea. Hell, it's often been asked, if God is good, why did he create hell? If God is good, why do people go to hell? Well, hell wasn't created for you. Hell wasn't created for any of us. Hell was created for the devil and his demons. And God longs to bring judgment only on them. But if we refuse to put our faith in Jesus, if we refuse his salvation to put, put the blood of the Lamb over our lives by repenting and surrendering our lives to Jesus as Lord, then we will get the judgment that God only longs to bring on the enemy of our souls, only longs to bring on Satan and his demons. So that being stated, I want to recap and then I want to leave you with a question. First off, this is kind of the bottom of the cup recap. Justification isn't a declaration that you're not guilty of sin because you are and I am. It's simply a declaration that we are forgiven of sin because of Jesus' death in our place. Therefore, justification isn't something we earn. It's rather a forgiveness we receive. And this is important because it reveals to us that God loves us even in our sin, even in our sinfulness. God loves us and longs to bring us to himself. Two, justification, uh, our part in justification is by grace to put our faith in Jesus as Lord, to surrender and to believe that he died in our place and was raised from the dead in our place and choose to live for him as Lord. And then finally, um, hell, this is the, the third takeaway I want you to have, is hell is for Satan and his demons. God doesn't desire for any of us to go there. Uh, but we are born into sin. We're born into slavery to self selfishness and self-centeredness. And if we reject the Lord uh, as our Savior, we will experience the judgment that God only desires for Satan and his demons. So I'll leave you with a question to ponder. Are you justified? Do you know that you know that you know that your sins have been forgiven, that Jesus just didn't die for the world, but, but like he's died for you and, and you've surrendered to his salvation? Do you know that you know that you know that? If you can't look back at a, at a time when you surrendered your life to Jesus and, and, and received his, the blood of the Lamb for you or um, were justified by him, then I encourage you, talk to me or talk to one of our leaders. God bless you. I hope you have a good day.